Well, I'll just go ahead. Anyway, Op Michael Oppenheimer's talk is co-sponsored by the Block Island Historical Society, and we give a special thanks to Dead Eye Dicks for providing the pre-talk meal. Please consider a donation to support these Tuesday talks. Now I'm too loud? Oh, you're, you're jealous. Well, you can, maybe you can take these over. And, I don't know. Anyway, please consider a donation to support these Tuesday talks and help further BIMI's educational mission. And stay after for refreshments and socializing. Dr. Oppenheimer is the Albert G. Milbank Professor of Geosciences and International Affairs at Princeton University and Director of the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment at Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He has been an author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC reports, which won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. And he's been a co-author of those reports since way back in 1990. And as many of you know, Michael has been a homeowner and summer resident on Block Island for many years, at least 30 now, 40, since 1976. We are indeed fortunate to have someone with his knowledge so familiar with the climate related issues we face on this island and are thankful that he graciously offers his expertise and provides counsel to the Sea Level Rise Committee and the Town Council here on Block Island. And with that, please welcome Michael Oppenheimer. Is this working? Uh, I'd like to do a comedy act. But instead, I'm going to do climate change. Um, how many of you were here last year when I spoke? Good. It's good. I mean, good that we have actually mostly people who didn't hear this before. It's going to be, it's going to be a different talk. It isn't. Okay. Oh, so I have to speak louder to get those people to hear. All right. Okay. How's that? Okay. Um, so, so I'm going to repeat some of the things that I said last year in brief. I'll make a quick introduction of the issue so that those of you who weren't here uh, don't aren't left out of the rest of it. And then in the end, what I really want to get to is the incredibly complicated and exciting developments of the last few months on climate change, where it looks like finally the US is going to step back into the game after having been after having stepped out of a leadership role for four years. And that, for someone who's been in it for a long time, we've seen these things before. You always think this is the greatest moment ever on this issue and it's a piece of cake from here. This is a long slog. It's gonna take you know the rest of this century to solve this problem, but we have to at least start to get it under control now or else it basically runs out of control and we'll, we'll have changes that will exceed our ability to successfully adapt. We don't want to get there. And the whole conversation now, which you may have heard fragments of, of the, the targets developed at, uh, at the Paris Agreement of avoiding a warming bigger than one and a half or two degrees Celsius, and you can double that if you want to get Fahrenheit roughly, uh, the, the, the uh, target that the Biden administration set of reaching uh, net zero emissions, which I'll explain in a little bit, by 2050. All of that is happening in many, many other countries. And it's all aimed at avoiding a climate zone where things start moving so fast that the changes we're seeing are dangerous because we can't cope with them. And so, and we're right at, we are at a moment, whether this moment turns out to be the most important one or not, who the hell knows? And we won't know until basically it's all over and we've reined it in, hopefully. Uh, but we are at a moment where we have a chance to actually catch up after having basically done very little for the last 20 or 30 years, when actually we, we knew enough to start in a modest way moving on this issue starting in the mid-1980s. And is a, there's a lesson there. 
about how political systems are or not effective. And you have to keep in mind while we're talking about this, that although it may seem that these are too to many, not necessarily all of you, that the problem is one that's self-evident and that government should have moved to solve a long time ago, that the world is a complicated place, that it was always easy to kind of put this one off because there was nothing in front of us forcing us to realize what the problem was about. And that other things were more important than people thought and came first. But if we'd started paying attention, even in a marginal way to climate change back 35 years ago, we would be in a lot better position today. Just keep that in mind. There are other problems that are like that that are gonna come along too. So um, I'm gonna show a few slides. Let me get implements over here, which I always manage to mess up. Uh, by the way, let me add my thanks uh, to, um, to BIMI, to the Block Island Historical Society, to Dead Eyes, where we just had a wonderful meal. And um, also, I'll give a special pitch for the, the, the uh, Dick's Fish, which is attached to Dead Eyes, which is terrific. Uh, this is an unpaid advertisement because I'm, I'm there almost every day. Um, and uh, so, anyway. This is what I'm going to talk about. Now, the slide I used to lead my talk last year was essentially the same. I just changed the title, uh, but the heat slide is the same because it gives you, uh, and you know, all these color, you know, by the way, you get all these things from the space telescope, it's the big uh, PR push on and out. All the colors are fake, of course, and they don't mean anything except uh, they're put there to entertain people. This is with the climate change slide, it's a little bit there like that, but there is a, a direct connection after all between uh, heat and the color red in people's minds. So you can see that what's happening is if earth warms one and a half or two degrees, which is what the Paris average do, we'll be in a lot cooler position than if we warm four degrees. And so again, that's Celsius, four degrees is basically seven degrees Fahrenheit. And it still may not sound like a lot, but if, you, if the earth warms even by two degrees, the, re, the really extreme temperatures, the frequency in this neighborhood, it's say of hitting 90, 95, 100 degrees goes up. It doesn't like double between one and a half and three degrees or two to four degrees. You get increases in these extreme events by factors like 10 or 100, which I'll talk about a little later. That's a quality of the climate in general. The, probability of any one type of bad day increases radically as you move the average temperature just a little bit. So, whoops, that went the wrong way. How do you like that? I pushed the back button and went forward. So uh, this is a, a roadmap for our talk. I'm going to recap a few of the points from last year. I'm going to talk about how this might affect Block Island in particular. We're going to talk about the new political or policy setting that's been developing out there in the last few uh, few weeks and months. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the world in general and where I think it's going to move on this issue. So this is, ju this is just a, I'm, I'm going to assume that you know the general outlines of the problem. That is, there are certain gases that occur naturally in the atmosphere, like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane that humans are increasing the quantity of in the atmosphere, mostly through the burning of coal oil and natural gas. And that would be fine, except those gases trap heat that would otherwise escape into space. And they perform a function the, when they're at their natural level. They keep Earth having a moderate climate. Without the greenhouse gases, Earth would be about 60 degrees Fahrenheit cooler than it is now, it would be a frozen desert. Human beings and other surface life would not have evolved and we wouldn't be having this conversation. That's the greenhouse effect. We know this because of the, the way the atmospheres of Mars and Venus are composed with uh, Mars having a tenuous atmosphere with few green, lower amounts of greenhouse gases, very little trapped heat. Venus having an atmosphere which is very dense with carbon dioxide, 
a lot of the heat that would otherwise radiate from the surface gets trapped in the atmosphere. And that's why the surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. Venus is that hot, mostly not because it's closer to the sun than the Earth is, as I used to think when I was a kid, it's mostly because of the greenhouse effect. The physics of the greenhouse effect is well established. It's clear. It works in the laboratory. It works in the computer models. It works on Venus and Mars. We don't have any doubt about that. So the difficulty is that the greenhouse effect has turned into a greenhouse problem with us cooking up the levels of the gases. There's one more thing I'll tell you in that basic lesson about it is that when you warm Earth, Earth responds. It just doesn't sit there. And part of the response is actually that the oceans get warmer. And because they're warmer, more water vapor evaporates from the surface of the ocean. Water vapor goes into the atmosphere. What did, what did I say a few minutes ago? I said water is a strong greenhouse gas. So what we're doing is what's called a positive feedback. And we're producing more warming by the response to the initial buildup of carbon dioxide than the, than the initial buildup itself. One way to say that is if you doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but didn't have any positive feedbacks in the system, Earth would only warm about one degree Celsius or about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. But because of these positive feedbacks, which are the water vapor feedback and the melting ice feedback, ice on the ocean surface reflects sunlight. Uh, but if you melt ice, you have a dark surface instead of a light surface. The surface of the ocean absorbs that sunlight, absorbs heat, gets hotter. That's another positive feedback. Clouds are another feedback, which on balance is positive, although some clouds, if you get more or less of them, create a negative feedback and have a cooling effect. When you add it all up, the warming that we get, uh, we're going to get from doubling the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is about three times that initial one degree Celsius. And that's what turns what could be a modest warming that human beings wouldn't pay much attention to into a really big headache. And I'll get back to that later. Uh, so here, I think I slipped ahead here, did I? No, yes, I did. Okay, I'm going to put this down so I don't accidentally play with it. Um, so this is these are the projections of what happens to Earth's average temperature, global mean surface temperature, if we keep pumping up the greenhouse gases without implementing policies. Those are the high curves there. They've got labels on them like SSP-8.5, forget that. Uh, that's just an indication of a high emission scenario that is very unlikely, but some geniuses, when they thought about how high emissions could be in the future, think that that emissions pathway could happen. Anything in the pink band is what we will call a high emissions pathway. Then we get the middle thing, SSP 2-4.5, forget those numbers as soon as I say it, that's sort of neither high nor low. And then they get the low ones, if we have diligent efforts to control the greenhouse gases, and that's sort of the blue band. And that those indicate what our future is. But you notice there's a huge uncertainty there. If we get low emissions, the lowest um, curve there is one in which the posit let me let me rank, crank back a little bit. I talked about po positive feedbacks a minute ago. We don't have a precise notion of how they add up how big they're gonna be. Different climate models say different things. They have different estimates of what the physics is. Mostly it's due to this uncertainty about the, how the clouds will respond. Will high clouds, well, today you have low clouds. You've got the tops of thunderheads. They reflect a lot of sunlight. They have a cooling effect. On the other hand, the top of a thunderhead blows off something called an anvil. If you look at it, they're asymmetric. The, the prevailing winds blow uh, the, the thin clouds from the top forward of the thunderhead. Those are cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are very tenuous. They don't reflect sunlight. They act like greenhouse gases and they absorb the heat coming off Earth's surface. So depending on the future, whether we get more or less of those anvils, whether we get more or less thin clouds up high, and whether we get more or less dense clouds down low, as we're seeing somewhere on the horizon today, you can get a different effect or a different feedback on the climate system. And this is one thing where there's a lot of uncertainty. It is the biggest uncertainty 
in the projections of the climate models. And it keeps us knowing whether for a given set of emissions, if the average uh, estimate of the models is three degrees, whether actually we're gonna get it closer to two degrees or closer to four and a half degrees. And nobody can honestly answer the question yet. And that means making upward policies to address the problem have to recognize a very big fundamental uncertainty. Anyway, the, the smear or the pink band among those, uh, around those high emissions trajectories represents that physical uncertainty. It's the uncertainty in the model. Some models show low feedback, some high feedback. The high feedback, you get a five degree Celsius warming by 2100. The low emissions band, the blue band, again, the same thing. Low emissions plus low feedback gives you the lowest curve there, SSP 1-1.9. High emissions, uh, low emissions plus high climate sensitivity means high feedback. You get the top of the blue band. So you can step forward there and say, okay, I see two kinds of uncertainty. There's a width of that smear, that the uncertainty and the feedback, but there's also what are the emissions going to be? It, it really, although we have a a lot of experts working on this. Nobody can tell you exactly what emissions are going to be 100 years from now, 80 years from now, because we don't know, are we still going to be driving cars? Is everybody going to have their own, you know, personal elevation device? I don't know. Are we going to be living, in, everybody's going to, you know, live in mega mansions or people are going to live in smaller homes, which, are, you know, use less energy? I don't know. Is everybody going to turn vegetarian? which tends to be lower in greenhouse gas emissions if you look at the whole cycle, nobody knows. But those, so some of those things involve choices that people can make. Some of them involve choices that governments can encourage you to make. And greenhouse policy, therefore, isn't just about we have to convert from uh, coal burning to solar energy. That's part of it. But part of it are lifestyle choices that governments are probably not gonna make for you but you're going to have to make yourself one way or the other. And how will that add up? How many people are going to want to decide to be vegetarian, for instance? We don't know. It's hard to reckon. Those have to do with customs, norms, sociology. There is no way to protect, project 100 years forward on that. So that's why we have these uncertainties, and that's why we have emission scenarios rather than emission predictions. But that means we have you know, two kinds of uncertainty, and one of them we have some control over. That's the things I was just talking about, the uncertainty due to emissions, either through co -op, co collective action involving government or individual action, we can make a difference. And that's the difference between the high band and the low band. On the other hand, the physics, the feedbacks, we don't control that. You know, that's presented to us by nature, by laws of physics, by God, however you want to have it. So, that is uncontrollable. So we have part of this problem, these uncertainties we could reduce, and part of it we cannot. So you're stuck inevitably by about not being sure exactly where you're going to land in the future. And over time, science will narrow those bands, but it's never going to make the bands one answer. And you have to be comfortable with that. This is a complicated problem today. It was a more complicated problem 50 years ago it's still going to be somewhat complicated in the future. And by the way, one more thing. A one degree world, and this, by the way, is one degree above end of the 19th century, what we roughly call pre-industrial, although it isn't really. Uh, a one degree world is a hell of a lot easier to adapt to than a five degree warming world, which in my own humble opinion uh, would be disastrous. So my view is, let's keep it in the blue band, just so you know my top is fired. Sea level rise, temperature response, sea level response and temperature. Why? Ice melts. There's a lot of ice around Earth. Some of it is in the mountain glaciers. They're melting. Some of it is in the ice cap. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not really the ice cap. The ice sheets of Greenland and Antarctica. There's a heck of a lot of ice bound up in those ice sheets. In fact, if they all melted completely, sea, sea level would rise something close to 200 feet. Relax, that's not going to happen. It's in order to melt most of the Antarctic ice sheet, uh, 
you'd have to have a double digit warming and stay there for probably a few thousand years. There's too much inertia in the ice sheet as it is, it's too cold. Unfortunately, there's a significant part of West Antarctica and a significant part, small relative to the rest of East Antarctica, but still significant in terms of the amount of ice that is potentially vulnerable to the kinds of temperatures I showed you in the last slide. That happened. Yeah, I told them not to give me this because even if I don't touch it, it will move. Other people don't have this problem. I have this problem. The climate skeptics have wired this against me. Anyway, you get the same picture with sea level rise, essentially, that you get with temperature. You've got a band of blue or low emissions and a band of high emissions, and you have the different choices in between of, what, of a particular scenario about the future, and the bands represent the difference that the feedbacks make. And that ripples over from the temperature projection into the sea level rise projection. Again, I stopped short of the third reason. Mountain glaciers, parts of the ice sheets, uh, with eventually it's possible that up to 15 meters of sea level rise could come out of Antarctica and Greenland together. A lot of sea level rise. With that one multiplied by about three, you get the feet. Um, and what's called thermal expansion, water expands when you heat it. That's pretty well known. Uh, same thing with ocean water, as it gets warmer, it expands. It takes a long time to expand because the ocean is very deep. The water, the heat has to penetrate to the bottom of the ocean. Those layers are very expandable because they're under a lot of pressure. And as it heats, it'll push up. But that whole process takes 500, 1,000 years to reach equilibrium. So as, as we start heating the bottom of the ocean, which we have already, I mean, the heat hasn't even gotten that far, but it's slowly getting down there. It, if, even if we stopped everything, sea level would keep rising at a lower rate for some time, I mean, centuries, because of that long leg of the system. And that's why if you look at the lowest emission curve in 2100, the lowest part of the blue curve, it's still, it's still going up. It's starting to tend to level off, but it's still going up. So sea level rise is a problem we're gonna be dealing with here and everywhere else on the coast of the world for a long, long time. And so this, you, if you want the coast to be, you know, to have a manageable future that preserves ecosystems and is friendly to the human endeavor, we're gonna to have to stick with it. We can't just say, all right, it'll be solved in five years. That isn't what's gonna happen, okay? It's gonna take continual focus. Um, let's see, then just in case it seemed too simple, see the dash curve. That is the, the, the blue curve, the blue and the yellow there, I'm sorry, the blue and the red or pink, those indicate what we think, you know, 85% or 90% likelihood is what that is, is in there. But as you notice, really, we have pretty good agreement around mid-century 2050, then the whole thing expands. What actually, if the scientists will tell you, if you prod them, that really we're, we're actually much more uncertain about what's gonna happen by 2100, because we have no good model of what the ice sheets will do. We don't have a complete physical picture. And that's why this dash curve has been thrown in there. This is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The dash curve gives you a scope of what's the worst possible outcome that scientists think could happen. And there you get a sea level rise of uh, one three quarter meters by 2100, which is you know, five, six feet. So we don't know in 2100. And that's why one of the bottom lines, one of the things I told the Sea Level Rise Committee the other day is think about 2100 as a planning horizon, but think about 2050 as an action horizon, because you'll notice we have a pretty good idea. It's gonna be about one to two feet of sea level rise global mean around 2050. But by the time you get to 2100, we don't have a very good idea at all of what's gonna happen. So we're, it's a moving target. So the way to think about planning for sea level rise is do things starting now for 2050, because you have no excuse by, by pointing, as has been done for a long time, point to the scientific uncertainty. That's not an excuse anymore. We know enough to be much less uncertain than we used to be. But 2100, there's a lot of uncertainty. 
And there's some time. It's 80 years from now, 78 years. Ooh, less than I thought, you know, it's shrinking. So what we need to do is plan and build scenarios for what we do in the what if world that we are on the worst curve or the what if world that we're on the lowest curve. Because if you spent the amount of money to protect against the worst curve, and it turns out you're on the lowest curve, you wasted a lot of money. On the other hand, if you plan for the lowest curve, but you're on the high curve, you're screwed. So you have, you have to be intelligent about it. You have to revisit this problem continually. You have to do what's called iter iterative planning. You do something, you act, you make sure it's not a, a, a an irreversible action. You make sure you're sort of building up to something. You come back, you learn the science gets better. You have observations of sea level rise. You learn more about your capabilities, including your engineering capabilities. You do, an, do another adjustment and you go like that. Maybe every 10 years you're revising and what you're, what you're protecting or not protecting, that's subject to change also. So just that's why I say it's a problem that needs to be focused on continually over the course of this century, because partly our knowledge is just changed. Okay, now one thing, to, those are all global average numbers, but there is no such thing as a place with a global average. It's, a, it's an average of sea level rise at all different places, every place around the world. And the fact is, that sea level rise is different every place around the world. If you, um, if you average everything together and you do the picture of, uh, of what's called a distribution, how sea level rise is distributed geographically, you get about a plus or minus 30% range. Some places 30% above the global mean, some places 30% below the global mean, but those are all, uh, uh, those are the, what's called one standard deviation. If you learn statistics, you know what that means. If you didn't, it doesn't matter. You wound up just as good in life as those who did learn statistics. Don't worry about it. It just means there are some outliers that are even much higher or much lower. And here we have a good representation of it from this neighborhood. So uh, Norfolk, Virginia has a very high sea level rise compared to the global mean. Um, Newport has high, but not, you know, it's about 60% above the global mean. And then there are some places in the far, far north that are lower than the global mean. Why are there those differences? Those differences are because number one, the thermal expansion term is different in every place because every place, the ocean warms non-uniformly. So different amounts of heat are sinking down under the surface and causing that thermal expansion. Difference from place to place. Mountain glaciers are different because each of them is subject to a different amount of warming. It's not uniform, the warming around the Earth. Showed you that in the, the cover slide. And the same thing with the ice sheets. They do not do identical things in, in, to every location. In particular, the ice sheets, I'll tell you this one story. Uh, it's not necessarily the most important one, but to me, it's the most fascinating thing. The ice sheets are so big that they attract water towards so around both of the ice sheets, the Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet, there's a bulge of water. The ocean is actually a little higher in a donut ring around each of those ice sheets. And as the ice melts due to global warming, uh, that's because the, their mass attracts water. If you, It's just like the Earth attracts the moon. But if you get, as you lose ice from each of those ice sheets, they exert less gravitational attraction to the water. So the water tends to dissipate to the rest of the ocean. So actually, there's a component of sea level rise or sea level fall, which results from that change in the attraction that the huge mass of each ice sheet has for ocean water. Because as they melt, that falls dissipates and it goes elsewhere and adds to sea level rise in other places. So you see kind of a diminute, that's one reason you have less sea level rise in places like Northern Sweden and more as you get closer to this neighborhood. And then there are four or five other reasons which are slightly less colorful, so I won't go into them. Uh, but it does say that this part of the Newport, the sea level rise at Block Island, and we've just put in some tide gauges, right, Nigel? Good, so uh, that, the sea level rise you'll measure here is probably pretty close to what you get in Newport. I say that because Montauk, 
hour away also. You know, it's like halfway, we're halfway sort of between Newport and Montauk. The sea level rise of Montauk is very close to what Newport gets. So sea level rise is the average change. That's not, in many people's view, the most important thing about sea level rise. You think about what goes on on the coast and you're all very familiar with it if you're out here very much. First type, you get a lot of variability. The first type is the tidal cycle. High tide, low tide. Higher high tide, lower low tide. Four different tide positions a day. Um, then there's what happens when a storm comes along. A low pressure system. Um, low pressure actually sucks the ocean surface up a little bit. And then the winds around it push water in this neighborhood from the center of the ocean toward the coast. And you get a bulge for storm surge. And that's where storm surge comes from. And it's a little different in every place because the storm surge that you get at a particular location depends on the configuration of the coast, the depth, the bathymetry, and the geographical configuration around the surface. So for instance, the, the, during Hurricane Sandy, the surge that the battery in Manhattan got was much bigger than the surge that a lot of other places out on Long Island got, and that, or the Jersey coast. And that's because it's like at the top of a funnel, you know, with the coastline. It's in New York Bight, Jersey, well, from your point of view, Jersey coast, Connecticut, down out here somewhere, you know, it comes and it goes up and all of a sudden you got New York Harbor and the battery. Well, that kind of funneled the surge. And so the surge is quite a bit higher in, at, at the battery. And so, and so typically, for instance, the 100 year flood height above mean, high, above mean higher high tide in, at the battery is about 1.8 meters, you know, about six feet. That's the 100 year flood. The 100 year flood out here above mean higher high tide is more like four, four and a half feet. If you measure it from low tide, it's seven feet. So you have to be careful about the baseline. So what that means is you've got a, something which is very dependent on where you are and how the coast is configured. Then you've got waves. This wave set up as it comes into the coast. You've got swash, which is the technical, highly scientific name for what happens when a wave crashes on the sand and goes running up. And then you've got that poor sucker with the house that's you know, if it's close enough, the next the swash is going to get to it eventually. And all of these things that are going on there are then shifted upward by sea level rise. So sea level rise is just pushing all those ladder rungs up. And you can make a rough estimate. It's not exactly the case. It's actually more complicated that if we get two feet of sea level rise, we'll push the high water from each of those things up by two feet. And that way, say, the hundred year high water mark, the current or historical 100 year high water mark is if it's now four, four and a half feet out here, it's gonna go up by two feet. So it become, it starts looking like, instead of what a hundred, once in a hundred year storm looks like, it looks like, whoa, that's more like what, I don't, I don't know about make it up, what the once in 500 year storm used to look like. So we're changing all of that. And, and that means that flood levels, which used to be very uncommon, will become much more common in the future. And that's the second thing you need to worry about. So that, for instance, when you translate that into actual numbers, Jacksonville, Miami, San Diego, Los Angeles, Honolulu, are, are we predict, going to, by 2050, 28 years from now, the, once in a, the, the historical once in a hundred year flood level will happen once per year. Okay, got that? In the, in the next set of cities, New York, Boston, San Francisco, Charleston, South Carolina, that doesn't happen until 2100, but it's an ongoing process. So all those, what used to be rare storms, the 100 year flood is the benchmark we use for a lot of purposes, all gonna happen more frequently. And the exact extent of how frequently depends on what, what, where you are on the coast or what the configuration. That's the thing. I spent a lot of time working on that the last few years. It's the thing I worry about the most. There are other things to worry about with the problem though, obviously. So that's the statement. 
keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that other parts of the climate system behave very similarly. That what you're doing is you're taking what used to be rare events and you're making them common events. And to understand what climate change really means, what it really means is as you make a historical event that used to be very rare, very common, is the human ability to adjust to that change up to the challenge. We were adjusted to a world where the climate wasn't changing very much. And all of a sudden, we're turning it upside down and a lot of things about the climate are gonna be changing. That means things that never used to happen in a human lifetime, 100 years is beyond the average human lifetime, are gonna happen several or many or all the time in a human lifetime. Are we up to that change? We're adapted to the things we're used to. We're poorly adapted to things like 100 year storms. They cause a lot of damage that don't have to happen, partly because we're settled in places we shouldn't be, but partly because, okay, having settled there, are we gonna protect ourselves? And we have, we do, we protect ourselves against the five year storm or the 10 year storm, but not the 100 year storm very well. Some places, the Netherlands sort of have it down. Okay, so that's Block Island. Um, so um, this is the four foot line, again, above mean high or high tide. That means the highest high tide of the day from the two. Uh, and again, look at the benchmark. Some people have that as seven feet because they're using lower, a lower low tide to do the measurements. So you have, you have to be careful. Um, so with a modest warming, comparable to the higher of the two Paris Agreement targets, uh, this water level returns once in five years in this neighborhood, and I'm using Montfort and New Newport to figure that out, but once every five years by 2050, and returns 20, but it returns 20 times per year by 2100. 20 times per year, you get what used to be a once in a hundred year flood. The reason it can return that much, you can say, what is he crazy? We don't get 20 storms a year. That's right, but you get a lot of high tides. And at a certain point, if you raise sea level enough, that becomes, you're adding it on top of a high tide, you're getting into that, that range, okay? So this is a big change. And when we think about planning, we ought to think about protecting against numbers like this. Like I said, the lower number, there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't know exactly what sea level rise is gonna be. But the, but the, the uh, 2050 number, we know that pretty well. Again, sea level rise around here, probably one to two feet. So from there, you can start thinking about what risks you're gonna protect against. Uh, just so I don't talk only about sea level rise, remember there's a lot of other stuff going on with this problem. This shows soil moisture, which is, you know, usually precipitation is the more common measure that people wanna hear about. But actually, precipitation isn't the whole ball game when it comes to water usage. You want to know how much of that water that gets precipitated actually winds up being usable because it didn't evaporate back in the atmosphere. You have to remember that in a warmer world, there will be more evaporation if there's water around. And so you have to take both factors into account. So you look at not just precipitation, but runoff. You do a lot of complex modeling and you find out where the, the soils essentially are gonna get drier. This is usable water. In other words. Where are they gonna get drier? Where are they gonna get wetter? Blue is wetter, brown is drier. I took the numbers off because they were too confusing even for me without sitting and staring at them for a while. So in a one and a half, these are the two Paris targets, one and a half and two degrees Celsius above late 19th century temperatures. You start to see already, Look at the southwestern United States and look how it's starting to dry out. But then look at four degrees. If we, did not, if we sat on our hands and never did anything to, st to slow emissions, to get a, a very dry area there. All of Central America, people are worried about people in uh, Central America moving up into the United States. My mind, migration is a good thing, but let's face it, there could be a situation where there's just so, so much incentive to move that it becomes an unmanageable situation. This, we already have political issues, let's put it, that arise from migration across the southern border. 
one can envision a situation where this might get worse. Same thing in Europe. You'll see the whole the Mediterranean basin slowly drying out, really bad for a four degree world. Same thing, they have an equivalent issue with migration into Europe. Um, uh, you know, tra traditional, partly because Europeans colonized Northern Africa, there are cultural bridges there. Uh, it's very close by, but climate change is probably gonna make that situation worse. You can play out scenarios which are okay for both sets of borders because we think ahead and manage what the flows we expect. And then you can think of situations where nobody does a damn thing to either help people survive with it by staying where they are or makes it more comfortable for them to come and and the, so that there'll be a situation where they you know they can thrive as migrants have for hundreds of years in this country under the right conditions and which future do you want you have to figure climate change into that whole discussion right now uh and then there are areas the blue the green areas that are going to get wetter uh particularly the tropical zones, which are already pretty moist. The general rule is areas that are now hot and dry are going to get hotter and drier, and areas that are wet already above average wetness are going to get wetter, probably. And if you get all these issues related to food security, obviously crop, crop yields in some areas are already not growing as fast as they used to. They used to be able to keep up with population growth. The difference being we now have climate change and the benefits of the green revolution have run out. We need a new technology that's going to keep up with both climate change and population growth. And it has not emerged, although people talk about it a lot. And then there are the issues related to conflict, which arise from both lack of food security and, uh, and the migration question sometimes. Okay, so what do we learn from all, from all this? What have we learned from our experience on block iron with other issues? I made this point last year. This slide is basically stolen from this presentation. We have a lot of experience with the conservation issue. And block iron has done very well compared to other places in its land preservation efforts. And what did we learn? You need, you need the issue. You can't have a one-shot deal. This is an issue that has to be embedded in the culture of the community. It has to become part of the natural part of decision-making. People can never forget about it because the minute you do, stuff starts to happen that'll undo the gains that you've made. And um, so you need some kind of continuity and governance. And this is why it's so important that the, uh, the town council establish a sea level rise committee because for the first time, you're gonna have a group of people which will rotate over time that'll be looking at this issue that will accumulate an experience, knowledge, and a way of introducing it into the discussions in the community where the decisions are made about a problem that, as I said, is going to be with us probably for more than a century. And so, and then they have to go and try to get community engagement. The committee is trying to make, well, as a member of the committee here now, you can tell us the way I understand what you're doing is you're trying to make priorities. What are the important things to look at first? And what things do we wait on? You know, it's a, it's a group of how many people? Six, seven, eight. You know, it can end with that eight people. It has priorities have to be accepted generally. So there's going to be have have to eventually be some sort of attempt at having a community consensus. And then there's the unfortunate uh, uh, fact that you're a small community at the end of a pipeline of money where other people are grabbing off pieces of money before the money ever gets down here. You don't have a lot of control and you have a limited influence about what you get from the state. The state has limited influence about what they get from the federal government and most of the revenue is gotten at the federal level. And so that is always gonna be a problem. And there has to be a way that if there are gonna be, um, if sea level rise is gonna be dealt with and some of that dealing with may involve moving stuff around turning some areas on the island into places where you don't want development to either may remain or happen, or infrastructure related to say Corneck Road. That stuff is expensive and it can't be done overnight and it can't be done on the cheap if it's gonna be done properly. 
But you have to have make sure that when you're ready to go, when this community decides that something needs to be done, that the money is there to do it. So what the community should be trying to influence in Providence and then Providence in Washington is some continuous stream of money, a bank, if, if you wish, with a with that where there's always income, and then when the need comes by to spend it on coastal defense, that it will be there. That's the way long-term infrastructure projects get done in, in places that have access to more resources. You know, um, I use this example a lot, so if I use it last year, I'm sorry, uh, but I love it. Uh, New York City, where I live, um, built something called a third water tunnel. You may have heard this. This is because the other two water tunnels are old, they're leaking, but they can't shut either of them down because eight million, eight and a half million people survive on that water. So they started building a third one. They started building it in 1970. It was just completed last year. 50 years later, they focused. They were able to focus because A, people said, yeah, we need the water. We got to do this. But B, they had a slight increase in the water meter charges, which was hardly noticeable to property owners and which fed the coffers so that they could build over a long enough period of time the project. They could float bonds. They could do everything they needed to do. And the, the continuous funding, drip, 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 so to speak, allowed them to pay this, the service of debt that was paying for the project. And it, it's not simple, but somehow that kind of continuous income source has to be found. Today. That's my idea. It's not my idea. I stole it of a former uh, deputy mayor in New York City when I asked him how to fund it. Tony Shores. Um, so what's happened on Block Island since this conversation started? Well, the conversation is going on a long time, but finally with the committee, information and engagement, Nigel's tide gauges in place so we can get, we can know what's actually going on. I made a guess that it's somewhere between Montauk and Newport. And that, you know, that's, that's probably a good guess, but maybe not. Maybe there's something peculiar here. Let's find out. Governance and continuity, just the very existence of the committee. It's not a guarantee, but it's a good start on ensuring the community has a trusted source of information, guidance, and advice. Doesn't mean they're going to make decisions, town council will make decisions, but the advice, the trusted advice, hopefully, will be there. And then they're starting to pursue grants, but ultimately, it's much bigger stuff than the community alone can do, even with you know, the grant, uh, a random grant, but it's good anyway. Uh, further suggestions I had, as I said, focus on 2050 for planning and implementation. There are things you could do about sea level rise now. You go, you, you worry every year about the maintenance of your sewer system. People who, who have wells worry about, who live near the fringe, as I heard at the meeting, some people worry about salinization of their wells partly due to sea level. Uh, I don't know that that's actually happening, but there's a water surge, they'll find out. Um, so I, you know, there are things that, that, the, that are being done to maintain town infrastructure where they should not be done unless the thinking involves, well, by 2050, which is definitely within the planning horizon of most infrastructure decisions, sea level could be a foot or two higher. Let's make sure we don't put something in the wrong place. Um, 2100, it's a little different situation. It's far enough, so you don't, if, if you have, if you want to plan for what you think sea level rise is going to be in 2100, you can wait a little longer probably because you, you, you don't, there's all that scientific uncertainty, but you want to have scenarios. Like I had scenarios on the board. What if it's going to be five feet in 2100? What if it's only going to be two feet? What would we do? What would we do differently? And as the possibilities start to get foreclosed, which we start to learn that the really high number is impossible or the really no, low number is impossible. And as the government, the federal government starts coming down with money periodically, assuming there isn't this constant flow that I have in my ideal world in my head. But in fact, the reality is when there's a bad storm and people drown, that's when big money comes. Or when there's an opportunity like the infrastructure bill, 
you have to be ready to throw your proposal through the window because otherwise every other place in the United States along the coast is going to get there first and there won't be enough money to serve everybody. I guarantee that. You've got to think ahead. You've got to get ready. Um, and remember, it takes 30 years to, to plan and complete. If, you know, if they started if they started a process now to decide on what to do about Corneck Road, I don't know who they is, but if they decided and they and it it really it was a, a really sensible, you know, got the expert advice, looked at the finances, figured out a way to finance it, then do the the engineering drawings, then get people's cooperation who live on the neck because it's going to impact them a lot. If they if it's a big enough project, if they did all that, it could take as much as thirty years between. The conception and the completion. That's how long it took to complete the, the PEM surge barrier. That's how long it takes to do most big coastal projects. So you have to remember, you have to think well ahead. So you can't wait to decide what to do with 2100 until 2070 because it's already late. You have to, that, that decision has to be made much, much sooner. And that's the, what, the way I don't want to create too big a division between the 2050 planning horizon and the 2100 planning horizon. If there's something big we have to do for 21 to 2050, it's already too late to start, you might say. Or we better get it going now because we're already behind the eight ball. And then I already said, line up and the window's gonna close. And then just to go talk just briefly about what happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, so about three quarters of the greenhouse gases globally are from production and use of energy. And that goes into electricity generation. It goes into heating buildings. It goes into road you know, transportation, oil, gasoline, diesel. It goes into direct use of energy and industry. In the US, the numbers are a little different. Um, Electric power production used to be almost 40% of our greenhouse gases. There's been a switch in the last 10 years or so to natural gas, which is slightly, somewhat lower emitting, although it's a complicated issue, which I don't want to get into now. You can ask me in a question period if you want. Um, now, transport, the transportation sector is actually a bigger source of greenhouse gases than electricity production. Natural gas, um, it, it, not just natural gas, but renewables are also starting to be a big uh, uh, factor, which is why the electric power production is no longer the primary U.S. source. But globally, you'll still find electric power production as the bigger source than, um, than transportation. Anyway, that's the general picture. And so if you think about dealing with transportation, and electric power production, you're thinking about most of the greenhouse gas problem, particularly with carbon dioxide. So what happened at the federal level in the last few months? Number one, there was a Supreme Court decision for West Virginia versus, well, let me back up. There are basically three ways to deal with the government and you want to institute policies. Three ways to deal with uh, three types of policies. There are different ways to say this, but they all amount to the same thing. One is regulation. EPA or the Department of Energy issues rules like the, uh, the uh, corporate average fuel economy standards that govern motor vehicle mileage, MPG. That's one, one type of regulation. Uh, power plants had analogous regulations on them, have analogous regulations on them. Then there are um, financial penalties you don't lower your emission. And these are things like emissions taxes. And there was actually a plan to institute an emissions tax, which uh, Senator Manchin had tossed out of the predecessor of the bill that just passed. The bill that just passed is called the Inflation Reduction Act. It didn't pass yet. The House has to pass it. The president has to sign it. That's virtually guaranteed. Um, the Build Back Better Act was its predecessor. That never got that far. But it, in its original form, it had a fee for electric power plants, which emit too much. Manchin forced that out. Instead, there are incentives for both consumers and producers of electricity to 
uh, go to low emission sources like solar energy and uh, wind energy. And so you could look at this as a carrot and stick problem. And there are different carrots and different sticks. And the Supreme Court, uh, I'll back up again. In 2007, the Supreme Court decision said, yes, the US Clean Air Act as written without any further instruction from Congress allows EPA to set standards on greenhouse gas emissions. The Obama administration went ahead and started setting those standards. Uh, before they got to fully implement them, the Trump administration came in and reversed the standards, particularly on electric power production and motor vehicles. Then the Trump administration lost in the next election. The Biden administration set standards for motor vehicles, which are now in place, which are fairly strong. They go up to equivalent of about 50 miles per gallon by 20, I think it's 2030, but I'm not 100 percent sure, uh, maybe earlier than that. Um, but the Supreme Court came along in a case in June where it declared the power plant regulations that the Biden administration was trying to complete uh, as being as going too far and they needed to go back to Congress to get permission first. Well, if you think about it, you can't get permission to, to sneeze from Congress these days. There will be, the only reason the build back, the infrastructure bills get through is because it's done through a process called reconciliation, which only doesn't, which can't be filibustered and only applies to uh, the financial part of the government function, that is budget making. And because everything in there is attached to uh, a, a, an expenditure or revenue, that, that's why that the bill is, is going to pass Congress. That's why it got through the Senate this week. But anything else that involves direct regulation can happen. I'm exaggerating. There are a few things that EPA can still do, but they're so narrow. And with this Supreme Court, what's going to happen as soon as they try to be the least bit aggressive, the power, uh, not the power companies, they're in favor of this, actually. Uh, it's, it's actually the coal mining industry will be back in court suing the government slowing it down for several years and in the end if the court doesn't change they'll probably throw out any tough regulation so that stick has been severely weakened then again the, the mansion taking it out of build back better the, the financial stick of penalties Again, you can't expect much out of this or any foreseeable future Congress for the next four or five years to do anything serious on that end. So all that's left is carrots, that is giving industry special credit in the form of money to invest in non-CO2 non producing, non-greenhouse gas producing alternatives. And that's what the current legislation is about. That's what the inflation reduction in its climate section is mostly about. There's a little exception to that for methane, where there is some tough regulation. So we're, we're stuck with, uh, you know, there has never, let me put it this way, there has never been a strong, strong progress on any environmental problem in the U.S. at the federal level that didn't contain some kind of sticks. Usually there's a good combination of carrots and sticks. And until, that, until that happens, we're going to only limp along and do half as well, metaphorically speaking, as we can. So, but on the other hand, this bill also, it's a good bill, but it only does half the job. And it does go a long way, by the way, to restoring U.S. international leadership, which is important when countries like India and a few of the other countries coming over the development horizon and starting to be big emitters are thinking about how seriously they should take this problem because climate change in, for many of them is not the first priority. So what does this bill actually do? Well, US emissions were going down anyway since about 2007 due to a variety of changes, uh, more efficient cars, more natural gas use for electricity production, more efficiency penetrating the system. So if we just kept, and some, some strict policies, we just kept current policies, 
we'd be down about 24 to 35% from the 2005 value by 2030. Biden wants to get it down to 50% in order to, to get the US on a path so they have net zero emissions, which means you know, same amount of carbon dioxide going out of the atmosphere by doing things like encouraging uh, the biosphere to suck up more carbon. Most carbon winds up in the ocean. That's a hard process to enhance, but that's what net zero means is balancing the amount that goes up with what comes down. Mostly you do that by emissions reduction. Uh, and that's in turn necessary to try to meet the Paris targets. The trouble is every country on earth has to do the same thing. And a lot of countries aren't gonna wanna do that much, that tough level of emissions reduction that quickly, because again, they're at a different place on the development curve than we are. So actually we have to do better than the global average, better than net zero by 2050. And that's gonna be damn hard to get to. So this problem is nowhere near solved. But in any event, if you took that net zero 2050 as our goal, the reduction in the in, in the Inflation Reduction Act is all, there are three different models that have been run. They all agree it's it's somewhere, uh, it says 31 to 44%. They're all around 40% reduction from 20, 2005 levels, which isn't all that far from a 50%. Reduction. So it's a big step. It doesn't finish the job. The trouble is the politics of the next set of steps is very tough because it means dividing up the atmospheric allotment between countries that have different views on what's important to them and what is it. And that's it. So uh, I went on a little longer than I wanted to. Um, thank you. Anybody who wants to get up and leave, go ahead, I won't be insulted. But, uh, Anybody who wants to ask a question, I can hang around longer and answer your question. Yeah, I can. Somebody should. Anybody have another mic you could hand out? All right, good idea. How'd you know that? <laughs> You know, mostly I honestly try not to think about it that way, frankly. One of them's in their 30s, by the way. Um, yeah, the question was, you know, basically it's a version of, if you were younger, would you have children again? So, and they read, they, they, there are a lot of kids in their 20s asking themselves that question, and I hate that. It's, it's terrible that we really created a world like that for them. It sucks. Uh, from my own personal point of view, I tend to be an optimist. And I think, you know, we're not going to do it perfectly, but we'll struggle through this. We is a difficult word, though, because some people are not going to be able to struggle through it uh, because they don't have the resources or they don't have the, the, the social capital or they don't have the capabilities themselves to deal with whatever's going to happen. But most of I mean, humanity is not going to disappear. Times will get harder for a lot of humanity. In the United States, it doesn't have to be that way. There are big equity questions attached here. And if we handle those correctly, the US as a whole and for most individuals will, I think, be able to prosper in this period while we get the problem fixed. But there are no guarantees. And I could easily be wrong. You know, you just you have to take a view on life. And if you take a pessimistic view, you're going to curl up in a ball and give up. And I don't want to do that. My kids don't want to do that either. So they're optimists. They both are serious about this problem. I, I never brought it home. They just, it's, it's in the air with their generation. Uh, and uh, that's good. They're going to do something about it. Other questions? Yes. You're welcome. Thank you.
Okay, so the, qu the question is, uh, number one, can carbon dioxide be removed from the atmosphere through a process called direct air capture? I'm going to translate this question now. And we can say there are two forms of carbon capture. Uh, and we can talk about the other two. And the other, can you actually oppose or offset the climate change by shooting sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere, which will turn into sulfate particles, will, which will reflect sunlight and have a cooling effect? Both are being seriously considered. Both are subjects of research. Air removal of direct removal or direct air capture carbon dioxide means passing air through essentially big vacuum cleaners, hundreds of thousands of them around the world and chemically absorbing the carbon dioxide. And yes, that can be done. It's painfully expensive to do right now. So the focus is on how to make it cheap enough so it can sit in line with some of the other energy technologies. And in the end, we may have to do it just to, if we're serious about avoiding a warming greater than two degrees, there's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now, and we're so slow at implementing alternatives, we're probably gonna have to suck some of it out when you get towards mid-century. Will the technology be there? There is some hope on that end. It's, you can't solve the problem that way but you can cut the peak off maybe. Second question was, what about reflecting sunlight? There, there are dangers. Um, it, it turns out that yes, you can offset the global temperature by putting bazillion, these effectively little mirrors, little particles that reflect sunlight up in outer space. Uh, not uh, up in the stratosphere, it's not outer space, it's inner space. Uh, but the trouble is that has, that'll, cool Earth's average temperature, but it also changes precipitation patterns. And it also does a million little things to the climate that we don't understand. And the modeling isn't good enough to understand it. So that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's a nice topic for research. It's not a topic for commercial development. Uh, air ca direct air capture is, there are people doing it, trying to do it now. The third thing I mentioned, the last risk on it, is you could capture carbon dioxide before it's emitted from the stack of a power plant. That's called carbon capture and then buried underground, carbon capture and storage. That got pretty far as of 15 years ago, but the price was too high. And a concerted effort was, governments attempted to make a, make a concerted effort by focusing R&D money, see if you could drive the price down. Price went up instead. So the, uh, the, it's no longer looked on as a, a way, as when you know, to line up with sol with say solar energy or wind, or in some people's minds, nuclear to salt to reduce emissions. Uh, the trouble with it is the the, mo the greatest value of it was political. It was a trick, essentially. No, I don't mean that pejoratively. To be able to keep burning coal, because you could well suck the carbon dioxide out. There are a lot of other reasons to not be happy about keeping burning coal. So right now, it's kind of, you know, it's in the bill in the Inflation Reduction Act to make Manchin happy because he comes from a cold state. But right now, it, it needs a lot. It, it's, it's nowhere near as promising as it was if I'd made this talk 15 years ago. Others? Okay, that's that's a great. Uh, 